Welcome to the 2024 Speaker Series Celebrating Autoimmune Encephalitis Awareness Month. This is the second presentation in a series of five that the International Autoimmune Encephalitis Society will be doing throughout the month. My name is Tabitha Orth, and I'm president and founder of the International Autoimmune Encephalitis Society. And I just want to invite you to take a look down at the bottom of your screen where you'll see a Q&A box. You can put your questions in there. And at the end of the presentation, we'll see just how many um, questions we can get to as time allows. Today, we are just so pleased to be able to have Dr. Malad Kushnud, Kush, Kush and I'm sorry, I stumbled over that name. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Dr. Malad Kushnud with us today, talking about pediatric autoimmune encephalitis. He's a clinical assistant professor of neurology and child neurologist at the University of Southern California with expertise in Down syndrome, neuroimmunology, autoimmune encephalitis, and multiple, multiple sclerosis. Dr. Kushner graduated from the University of Louisville School of Medicine in 2017 and his residency in child neurology at the Children's Hospital in Los Angeles with an interest in rare disease processes. Dr. Kushnud has entered academic medicine to help train the future of pediatric neurology and help care for the most vulnerable of our population. He's authored an impressive amount of research to date, and we're really, really delighted to have him speak on pediatric autoimmune encephalitis with us today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you all so much. Uh, I also, for the record, go by Dr. K, uh, just because I know that my name can be a little difficult to pronounce. So I've gone by Dr. K for years now. Uh, but again, my, my name is Milad Khushnud. I'm a child neurologist with some expertise in pediatric neuroimmunology, and I'll be, uh, I'm privileged to give the talk today on pediatric autoimmune encephalitis. Um, make sure the buttons work. There we go. So some objectives at the top of the hour here. So we're going to try to understand what autoimmune encephalitis is, why it happens, and when it happens. We'll talk about the uh, wide and variable clinical presentations in pediatric patients. I'm going to provide some case examples before each major clinical um, uh, factor, if you will. Um, and then we're going to understand the difficulty of using tests alone in the diagnosis of autoimmune encephalitis. Uh, because I know that the talk about treatment was given last week, I'll kind of steer away from that for the time being to leave room for questions at the end. So... Most implicitly, what is it? Uh, so encephalitis is defined as inflammation or itis of the brain or encephalon. Uh, and autoimmune is where the immune system, whose job it is to attack viruses, bacteria, funguses, tumors, clear out the trash, so to speak, uh, ends up targeting the self or auto. Uh, we've got two major subtypes of this, antibody positive autoimmune encephalitis and antibody negative autoimmune encephalitis. I'll talk about the specifics shortly, but very simplistically, antibody positive means we know which antibody is causing the disease. Antibody negative is we have not found one yet, but hopefully we will someday. Uh, who does it happen to? Uh, essentially a question of epidemiology. Really, unfortunately, anybody. Um, as scary as that sounds. So it is increasing in frequency. I know the last few times the lecture has been given, they've talked somewhere around the line of 1.5 for every 100,000 people or 0.2 for every million people. It's increasing in frequency to 13.7 per 100,000 people. Um, that's not to say that there's some kind of immense contaminant in the world that's causing this to happen more, but we are getting better at looking for it. We're getting better at identifying it. And most importantly, getting better at treating it. The age range is quite variable, three to 87 years. I'm sure there are patients who are younger. I'm sure there are patients who are older, but we'll talk mostly about that born, um, that patient population of less than 18. Um, as with any autoimmune condition in our adolescent female population, they're going to have this happen more commonly than our males. So in the post-pubertal or adolescent range where you're closer to your hormone content of the adult population, you're going to have a three to one ratio, more likely to happen in women than it is in men. When you have your prepubescent mm -hmm. population or you're truly less than 12 years old uh, age range, it's much closer to one to one. Men and women or males and females end up getting affected at a very similar rate comparatively. 
And I put this here to just suggest that, again, it is increasing in frequency. And I think that owes more to the fact that we're just getting better at identifying it. When autism was first described, when Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, uh, even multiple sclerosis are increasing in frequency, so to speak. And that's mostly because we're just getting better at testing for it, better at identifying it. Now let's talk about why does it happen or etiology. So that comes down to a few different factors here. So it depends on the subtype of autoimmune encephalitis. It depends on your age and it depends on your sex. So if you're talking about adolescent patients, again, 13 to 18 range, give or take, we're talking about NMDA specifically in this situation. We break it down into thirds. A third of patients have an ovarian teratoma if they're female. A third of patients have had some kind of severe viral infection, such as HSV encephalitis in the weeks to months preceding their NMDA diagnosis. And unfortunately, a third is we're not sure. Now, things don't actually get much clearer when you get into the prepubescent population. We're mostly just not sure. There is a lot of suspicion that it has to do with molecular mimicry, where you have some kind of viral infection, some kind of bacterial infection, or some kind of tumor, and your immune system overreacts and causes a problem. Now, what does it exactly mean? So pathophysiology, which is the how does it happen factor of things. We talked a lot about the immune system so far. And when we're talking about the immune system, again, we're talking about white blood cells. You've got a whole bunch of different types of white blood cells, but the main players here are your lymphocytes. They're sort of the captains who tell your body when to attack something, how much to attack it, when to stop attacking it. And that's really guided by your T cells. Um, your T cells tell your immune system when how, how long, when to stop, and things like that. They also guide your B cells, which are in charge of creating what we call antibodies. So those are the factors where whenever you get a vaccine, whenever you get sick with something, your B cells job is to create a protection barricade or almost like an alarm system so that when you get, for example, the flu vaccine, the reason that you do not get the flu that subsequent year is because you have an alarm system. When the flu enters your body, it gets swarmed by a bunch of antibodies and your immune system gets rid of that flu. Now, unfortunately, despite doing their job more or less for the correct reasons, there can be a situation where an antibody is made that targets yourself. And often what that means is it's targeting a receptor in your brain. Your brain communicates with electrical signals, chemical signals, and things like that to target receptors that then lead to an effect of some kind. When you have an antibody that targets that receptor, unfortunately, what that means is that receptor is not working appropriately and it can lead to a lot of downstream effects of this. Again, this happens for a variety of reasons. Most often it's for two ones that we can clearly identify. One is molecular mimicry. Again, you're targeting a virus, you're targeting a bacteria, doing your job. Suddenly that virus has something that looks a lot like the NMDA receptor in your brain. And so for a whole host of reasons, those antibodies now start to target yourself. And that's how you have disease. The same thing can be applied to a tumor. Now, speaking of subtypes, because we've talked a lot about all the, all the different types of autoimmune encephalitis, um, there's a whole lot of research looking into what types of antibodies actually cause autoimmune encephalitis, okay? And when we talk about that further, we break it down, like I said before, into antibody positive and antibody negative. There are some other types of autoimmune encephalitis that I'm not going to talk too much about today, but just so you all are aware, Rasmussen's encephalitis uh, and ADEM, or acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. We're really going to be talking about mm -hmm. antibody positive and antibody negative. When you look at the antibody positives and you look at this graph, all of these individual names since 1985 and on are antibodies that we have identified that cause a constellation of symptoms that are basically autoimmune encephalitis. When you have antibody negative, all we're really saying is we think you have autoimmune encephalitis. We don't have a named antibody that is causing it yet. I say yet because as you look at this trend, you see that every year, give or take, we're identifying a new antibody and being able to better identify what that constellation of symptoms is. Unfortunately, though, most of these uh, antibody positive autoimmune encephalitis are still considered rare, except for NMDA. That is the most common type of autoimmune encephalitis that we have. And most of our data and literature focuses specifically on NMDA receptor encephalitis with a lot of other small case series as it pertains to the other ones. A lot of what I talk about today from the clinical standpoint, is going to be referencing NMDA, but does have applications to antibody negative and the other types of antibody positive autoimmune encephalitis. So let's go ahead and talk now about the clinical features of autoimmune encephalitis in the pediatric patient. So the first thing we have to ask ourselves is who do we test? So when a family comes in and says, this is not my child, you should already be concerned and say, what is going on here? 
Um, as a clinician, specifically in neuroimmunology, this is one of the most impactful statements that a family can make to me because it tells me that something is going on. Most families at this point know what their child looks like when they're five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, when they're sick with some kind of viral infection, some pneumonia, something or other. But when they come in and say, this is not my child, and they've known them for years, that tells me there's something else going on here that requires a great deal more attention. And so whenever I had that kind of statement made to me, I go back to the criteria set forth by Dr. Grouse, Dalmau, et al. back in 2016, looking at the clinical diagnostic criteria for possible autoimmune encephalitis. Mm -hmm. This is something that I reference constantly. At this point, I don't really look at it as so much as I have it memorized, but for those who are not super familiar with it, I want to point out something very important here. This is just a criteria for possible autoimmune encephalitis. It's when you should suspect something is afoot in a patient who comes in with subacute or very quick onset, psychiatric manifestations, working memory deficits, or altered mental status. That's a very low bar, but there's a reason that that's a low bar. Because this is increasingly becoming more readily identified, it's important to know who we should be testing for. And if a patient comes in with this rapid onset of psychiatric manifestations, note what else they need to have. They either have to have new focal central nervous system findings, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that means shortly, seizures, abnormalities of labs or abnormalities of imaging. So a low bar to include a wide number of patients on who should be evaluated for this possibility. This last section here, exclusion of alternative causes. This is a bit of a difficult one because I think that's the brunt of what makes autoimmune encephalitis so difficult is that there's a lot of different diseases, rare ones especially, that can look a lot like autoimmune encephalitis that are not autoimmune encephalitis and importantly have unique treatment implications. We'll talk more about these as we get to the latter half of the lecture as we talk about diagnostic tests, because that's really the main brunt of what that focuses on. And again, as I've discussed already, because NMD is still the most common autoimmune encephalitis in the pediatric population, I always want to put up this diagnostic criteria as well. And I want to draw your attention to this box over here. You need to have four of the six following major groups of symptoms. You'll notice abnormal psychiatric behavior or cognitive dysfunction. That's part and parcel amongst almost every single patient with autoimmune encephalitis. But in NMD, we've also got speech dysfunction, seizures, movement disorders, mm -hmm. decreased level of consciousness, and autonomic dysfunction. Those are going to be the bulk of the talk for today and what exactly that looks like. These also fairly consistently also apply to other forms of antibody positive and antibody negative autoimmune encephalitis. So what does it actually look like? What's the time frame of what these clinical features look like? Again, I'm going to provide a broad overview before I kind of dive deep into each major milieu of constellation of symptoms. But you've got here a viral prodrome on the far left-hand side. This can be anything like headache, fatigue, mm -hmm. just some uncomfortableness from some kind of viral infection or whatever have you. And then fairly quickly, within a couple of days to weeks, you've got psychiatric symptoms. Those become the bulk of your presentation until a few weeks go by when you finally start to develop some neurologic complications and you have suppression of your mental status. The goal in autoimmune encephalitis is to identify patients while we're in that purple phase, right? Because that's when we can make the biggest impact in terms of outcome treatments and things like that. And so a lot of what I'm going to talk about at the beginning is going to be talking about these psychiatric and cognitive manifestations because this is where we can really make a big effort in identifying these patients. So I like to present things in the context of cases because I think it sets the stage for all of the major constellation of symptoms that I'm going to be talking about. And so I'm going to go ahead and start with this young lady who uh, I took care of uh, back when I was in fellowship. She's a 13-year-old young lady with a year of hospitalizations for psychiatric manifestations. She's had multiple suicide attempts with considerable behavioral changes. Her mom noted that about a year ago, she suddenly started to be defiant, refusing to do schoolwork, going out, partying with mm -hmm. other kids. She'd always been a good student, though. Straight A's, was an obedient child. And overall, the mom just thinks this is not her daughter. She can't seem to remember anything, has moments where her speech is garbled, seems fully unable to comprehend what's going on. And she's made multiple suicide attempts, as we've mentioned in the past. Mom notes that she's often capable of understanding, but she wonders if the patient maybe chooses not to. And so the things that really point me towards autoimmune encephalitis here, this was a sudden onset of some kind of behavioral change. Even though it's been a year of symptoms, it was sudden when it first began. She'd always been functioning very well from a cognitive standpoint, now is not doing so well. She thinks this isn't her daughter. Her personality has changed in such a vast and rapid way that maybe this is something not related to just becoming a teenager. Her speech is garbled. This is a very subtle feature that didn't get a lot of focus when she was presenting to multiple other hospitals at the time, but something, these subtle things are 
often the things that will tip us off to say who needs that full evaluation. This patient was ultimately found to have anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis. She also interestingly had an ovarian teratoma. She was treated aggressively. Her tumor was removed. She's doing better in school. She's able to even act in a play, which is significantly improved compared to before, but she still has some lingering psychiatric manifestations that she, her mom, and her team are working herself through. Okay. Now, leads us into discussions about those psychiatric manifestations. Again, the this is not my child type of presentation. Mm -hmm. When patients present with psychiatric manifestation, that may often be the only thing that patients are presenting mm -hmm. because very few families are going to say, something is drastically wrong with my child. Let me just wait at home. Often they will say, I need to come and get my child urgently evaluated because I am terribly worried about my child and no one can give me an answer as to what's going on. This is a good breakdown and overview of some of the psychiatric mm -hmm. manifestations in a few of the more common autoimmune encephalitides, NMDA, GAD65, and voltage-gated potassium channels. You can see that there's a constellation of symptoms here, depressive features, plus personality change, plus psychosis, plus catatonia. A lot of these psychiatric manifestations often end up in the form of aggression or emotional liability, where patients will have very high highs and very low lows. You'll often hear that patients are having much more temper tantrums than before, or an otherwise calm child becomes extremely aggressive at the drop of a pin, right? And what I really want to draw your all's attention to is catatonia. In recent years, there's been a great deal of literature to suggest that catatonia may actually be the iceberg here. We had classically thought of this as a primarily psychiatric manifestation, a, a manifestation of schizoaffective disorder or schizophrenia or things like that. As we're starting to treat and identify patients more, we're realizing that especially with, with NMDA receptor encephalitis, mm -hmm. but other uh, antibody positive diseases like IgLON5, Casper2, and things like that, we're seeing catatonia as a mainstay feature here of patients who present. Now, that doesn't mean that all catatonia mm -hmm. suggests autoimmune encephalitis, but there are types of presentations of catatonia that should really make the neurologist and even the primary mm -hmm. care doctor or hospitalist suspicious that there's something more insidious going on here. This waxing and waning type of catatonia where one hour patients are frozen stiff as a board, where other hours they're very hyperactive and they're, they're, they're restless and they're moving around and they're unable to sit still, and other times where they're just frozen having a tough time moving around. Echolalia, which seems like a benign factor, which is essentially I say something and the last couple words of my sentence are repeated back to me. So I'll say something like, how are you feeling today? And the patient will respond with feeling today, feeling today. That'll often be what we describe as echolalia. And then posturing, which is where patients will not have a lot of spontaneous movement, but will just kind of get stuck in a very specific position. We found in the in the recent years that this is much more suggestive of autoimmune encephalitis than a consistent catatonia that could be suggestive of psychiatric disease. Essentially, what I'm pointing at here is if you see someone who comes in with rapid personality change, with rapid onset and severe catatonia, you should be suspicious for autoimmune encephalitis. What's also a major clue here is that these patients with autoimmune encephalitis are less likely to respond to medications. Catatonia will often get treated with something called a challenge of benzodiazepines, Ativan, clonazepam, things like that. In patients who seem to have primary psychiatric disease, we can see a rather marked improvement of symptoms as we quickly get up to the higher doses of benzodiazepines. Unfortunately, with autoimmune encephalitis, that's not the case. They will inconsistently respond, or they'll still have that waxing and waning degree of catatonia despite getting aggressive levels of benzodiazepines in their systems. They're also more likely to have side effects from these medications. I will often use these as soft signs to help guide my clinical judgment and determination of patients who come in with predominantly psychiatric symptoms. Now, the other big question here is, how do we identify patients who have a primary psychiatric disease versus autoimmune encephalitis? We still have no definitive history or tests or things like that that help us. But again, going back to those soft signs, the patient in this case example had a year's worth of psychiatric manifestations. Essentially, what that means is a prior diagnosis of any kind of psychiatric disease does not preclude the possibility of autoimmune encephalitis. In a sample of 91 patients just a couple of years ago, they found that in those who had primarily psychiatric manifestations, 45% ended up having a prior psychiatric history of some kind. Mm -hmm. What's important about this is all 91 of those patients went on to have autoimmune encephalitis of some kind, but their primary presentation was psychiatric manifestations. What that means is a prior history of psychiatric disease does not preclude the possibility of an autoimmune encephalitis.
Again, what's really important here is data is suggesting that it's less likely that patients with autoimmune encephalitis respond to medications and are more likely to have side effects. One study in particular found that if you ended up getting developing neuroleptic malignant syndrome, which is basically a fancy word for you get put on a psychiatric medication or a psychotropic medication, and you end up having a combination of fever, uh, rhabdomyolysis, and severe stiffness with altered mental status, that you may actually likely have autoimmune encephalitis more than you are just a side effect from a psychotropic medication. Now, again, kind of what are we talking about in terms of those psychiatric manifestations? We are kind of described a little bit about what those psychiatric manifestations are like. And typically for patients with autoimmune encephalitis, and this is best described in NMDA, they'll often have visual hallucinations, severe emotional ability, again, those very significant waxing and waning highs and lows. They'll have aggression or they'll be significantly withdrawn. Now, Beyond the psychiatric manifestations, because this is a neuropsychiatric disease, there's cognitive manifestations as well. Some of the clues that patients may have some cognitive decline are they're having decreasing performance in school. That's a very good metric of how kids are doing is how they're doing in school. Obviously, there's going to be some kids who uh, may not participate in school as robustly as other kids, but it's still an important factor where even teachers can pick up where this kid's been doing really well, but suddenly they're not. They'll bring that to the attention of the parents, and that's important information for us as clinicians to know. They can't remember their routine. So kids who are uh, in a good routine, they know that you know they wake up at 7, they eat breakfast, they go to school, they may have to get a lot more reminders than they're used to. They may have a loss of focus and attention. They'll tell them to do something. They just won't do it. And they'll say, oh yeah, I just didn't remember, but they may not have heard you in the first place. They may avoid answering questions altogether because they might laugh and say, oh, haha, ha, that's so funny. Uh, but they may just not be able to create the, you know, actually respond to a question. It takes a lot of working parts for you to be able to hear a question and then respond to it. And any kind of thing that disrupts mm -hmm. that can lead to that kind of dysfunction. The reason that I put this picture here is there's not a lot of objective tests for how people are doing. Oftentimes, people will just ask some routine questions of patients without doing some formal objective testing. But I find using a MOCA is a very good tool because if someone's able to pass the MOCA, even if they're 11 years old, we have ways to kind of make a MOCA work for them. If they're able to pass a MOCA, that tells us that enough of their brain function is there that maybe this is all a manifestation of primary psychiatric disease. But if you're not able to do most of this study, or you get a borderline exam finding, it's important to identify those patients to know who needs to actually get testing. I want to point out, though, one thing. Uh, the requirements of the MOCA are to draw a clock, put all the numbers on it, and put it at 10 past 11. Some kids nowadays don't actually know what an analog clock looks like. And so if a patient does every other aspect of the MOCA perfectly, but gets this one wrong, uh, I would kind of give them a couple of bonus points for that because it's not always the, the best metric. But the reason this is important, again, I, I want to stress getting these kind of objective studies is that in patients you do suspect have a, a autoimmune encephalitis, their MOCA day one may be different than their MOCA day 20 or MOCA day 50. And this may also be a good way to measure how they're responding to treatment. Okay. That's all for those types of factors. And now I want to kind of move on to seizures, sleep, and speech. And I think this case really does a, an excellent job of providing a good overview of all of those things. So we have a 14-year-old young man who was previously healthy, presenting with two weeks of finger and toe movements. His right fingers are flexing and extending, and his tones are fanning. And for those of you who can see me on the video, this was kind of all of his symptoms. He would just do this in a rhythmic kind of fashion, it would be in line with what his toes were doing. This happens almost constantly, multiple hours at a time. It's not painful, but it's quite annoying. The patient's been noting as well some trouble sleeping. He thinks this is maybe because of all the movements and his parents know that even while he's sleeping, the movements can sometimes be there. He's also been having very odd dreams, very much out of the norm for him. He's stuttering as well on occasion and family thinks maybe this happens sometimes when he's tired and he laughs when you ask some questions, he'll often ask you to repeat those. The things that stood out to me in this case that made me say there might be something going on here, this two weeks of nearly constant finger and toe movements all of the right side of his body, the trouble sleeping, the stuttering on occasion, laughing when you ask him questions, those are all kind of signs that maybe there's something else going on here of concern. This patient, unfortunately, at the time was discharged because we really didn't know what to make of his presentation, and he otherwise seemed cognitively well. Uh, he actually returned about a week later. It turned out that those finger and toe movements progressed to having his right face involved as well. And he ended up having epilepsia partialis continua, which is a fancy word for one specific part of his brain is seizing 
It's not enough to cause him to lose consciousness like you ordinarily would with a seizure, but it's just causing a constant seizure of one specific part of his brain. He was also found to have anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis. He was treated aggressively with a combination of steroids, plasma exchange, and rituximab. Interestingly, he made a full recovery. Oddly, though, he's a straight-A student now, whereas before he was a B and C student. I don't have an explanation for that, but I always like to include that as a very fascinating tidbit. So what are seizures? Uh, that's an entire lecture in and of itself, and I won't spend too much time talking about that. I wish that this infographic adequately put together exactly what seizures look like in autoimmune encephalitis. Unfortunately, it does not. Uh, but it kind of depends on, again, on the subtype of autoimmune encephalitis you have. So for patients with NMDA receptor encephalitis, only about 60% will actually have seizures as a part of the constellation of their findings. Now, that sounds like a lot. It's the majority of patients, but that's 40% of patients that don't have seizures as part of their presentation. So we cannot always hang our hat and say, ah, you have psychiatric manifestations and seizures. Well, you've got autoimmune encephalitis. Inversely, we cannot then say if you don't have seizures that you don't have autoimmune encephalitis because a large percentage of patients do not ever actually have seizures as part of their presentation. Seizures, very simplistically, as was taught to me by my mentors, is a thing that happens more than once in a stereotyped fashion, okay? What are some clues that a seizure has happened? If you have fixed gaze with your eyes stuck open or stuck in a very specific direction, you cannot draw their attention away from that. That could be suspicious for seizure if it happens exactly that same way over and over again. Behavioral arrest, which is classified as if I walk up to you and boop your nose and you don't respond, which most people would, you could be having behavioral arrest and that could be a sign of a seizure. Stereotype movements or cluster of movements in association with that behavioral arrest. So in this young man, he was quite atypical because it was just this stereotyped movement. But that in and of itself was suspicious enough for seizure because it was so stereotyped. And then abnormal posturing out of sleep. Seizures we know happen more commonly out of sleep. And so if you find, for example, that your, your child, son, or daughter is waking up in the middle of the night with their eyes open and their hands flexed in an odd posture, and they're stuck that way for a few minutes and then drift off back to sleep, that could be quite suspicious and something to tell your physician about. Now, seizures in and of themselves are not just one-off events and then you just kind of walk about your day. Typically, what will happen after a seizure is you'll have something called a post-ictal phase, where your brain has had a seizure and your brain is now recovering from that seizure. That means that functions are not going to be normal for that period of time. Post-sectal phase can typically last 20 to 60 minutes in most patients, and it's considered the recovery phase. This is a very important clue because if you find that your child is doing an abnormal movement, but then immediately gets back to normal, it's much less likely that that's a seizure. But if your child does something where they kind of seem frozen in place and then seem very tired or very angry or very aggressive or... Uh, vomit afterwards. That could be a sign that there's actually something going on. So these are all things that your physician will ask about and the dutiful physician should be asking about to try to identify patients who have seizures, as these can be a very significant clue in patients who have autoimmune encephalitis. I'll briefly talk about long-term epilepsy. Most patients with NMDA receptor encephalitis actually go on to be seizure-free in the long term. About 10-ish percent will have some kind of long-term epilepsy. Patients with MOG, will have a about 20-ish percent chance of having a long-term epilepsy, even if they are treated aggressively and appropriately. And unfortunately, our antibody-negative patients, those who do not have a named antibody and get a, 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 a smorgasbord of treatments, may end up having a much more higher likelihood of having long-term epilepsy as a result of their autoimmune encephalitis. The main thing that I want to point out here, though, is that the seizures for patients with autoimmune encephalitis will not respond fully to medications. Medications will temporarily alleviate some of the burden of their seizures, but the true treatment for their epilepsy mm -hmm. is to actually treat the underlying immune abnormal process with immune modulatory therapies. Speech and language. This is a bit of a tough one because sometimes patients who present with psychosis won't have a very normal speech pattern even in primary psychiatric diseases, but there are some clues here that would make us think autoimmune encephalitis. Speech is a very complicated process that requires multiple parts of the brain to work in tandem to be able to do something like give a lecture um, and actually read the stuff on the board to be able to provide that lecture. In the setting of autoimmune encephalitis, because so many different parts of the brain can be affected by an abnormal antibody, those signals are going to be interrupted and you can have subtle clues that your speech is dysfunctional. Some patients can have complete loss of speech. They are unable to produce any kind of meaningful words. 
They may also still be able to talk, but they will not actually understand the words being spoken to them. And still some patients may have things like echolalia. It can wax and wane and vary from day to day, hour to hour, but language is also very importantly more than spoken words. In some patients who have autoimmune encephalitis, while they may not be able to speak or understand spoken word, they can still read. And that's a very important factor here. Upwards of 60% of patients with any kind of autoimmune encephalitis will have some kind of speech disturbance. This is more notably seen in patients with NMDA, but something to keep in mind in the patient who presents with personality changes with consistent speech problems. Sleep disturbances. This is not a part of any of the formal diagnostic criteria yet, uh, but sleep disturbances are very increasingly common in autoimmune encephalitis. Now, again, because NMDA is the most common form and we have the most data on this, I do want to show this wonderful infographic that shows you just the intriguing way that sleep patterns change with NMDA receptor encephalitis. There's a prodrome here before the disease even starts where patients will have trouble getting a consistent amount of sleep. They will often have insomnia or new onset of insomnia or a worsening of their insomnia with notably vivid dreams, as was the case in the presentation that I provided to you all. As patients begin to develop their psychiatric manifestations, their sleep, whatever what amount it was, decreases even more. Mm -hmm. It's quite interesting to note that because sleep is a multifaceted process in the brain, even little things, even early signs of some kind of trouble with the signaling can interrupt that pattern. And it can be one of the earliest clues that something else is going on here. Now, obviously, some psychiatric diseases present with some degree of insomnia, but these patients robustly respond to medications to help break that cycle and help them sleep. In patients with autoimmune encephalitis, medical intervention provides almost no meaningful impact on their sleep, uh, their sleep cycles. What will also often happen, not just in NMDA, but in many other autoimmune encephalitis, and this is increasingly well known, is you can have abnormalities in your sleep itself in terms of movement disorders. So you can have REM and non-REM behavior disorders. So classically, you can think of that as sleepwalking, sleep talking, acting out your dreams, having what mm -hmm. we call confusional arousals, where you'll wake up in a rage and start fighting whoever's nearby, trying to escape some kind of stimulus that's not actually there. This pattern, though, is so interesting because in, auto, in NMDA receptor encephalitis patients, once we begin to treat them, once we begin to put them on immunomodulatory therapies, what you actually find is you enter this hypersomnia and excessive sleepy stage, almost like the body's trying to compensate for the lack of sleep for so long. And then over a long period of time, I'm talking weeks to months, they get into a sleep normalization phase. I always at this point, anytime someone comes in with psychiatric manifestations, we'll do a deep dive into the patient's sleep history. For younger kids, that's a lot easier because most parents, such as myself, are still watching their children as they sleep. For adolescents, that may not be as common, but if they're running around the house or doing a lot of sleepwalking or acting out their dreams, that may be something noticeable to most parents and something that you really want to be asking about. Now we'll go ahead and move on to the next cluster of symptoms. That's movement disorders. And I think this case does a really good job of kind of outlining those. Eight-year-old previously healthy young boy comes in with decreased sleep and agitation, already kind of pointing out those things that we talked about. He's talking less than usual, constantly seems afraid of something, cannot describe what he's afraid of, but he's constantly looking around the room. He started new school as being bullied a lot, so they think maybe that has something to do with it, but he's much more easily frustrated by things and will have a lot of temper tantrums, which he never really had before. He started wetting the bed at night, occasionally also doing so during the day. He's got a lot of instances where he'll just stare blankly for a few minutes. He'll often laugh at the end of those episodes, and they're worried that he's seeing things. He's refusing to walk because as he walks, his legs kind of just dance around under him, and he makes a lot of weird faces while constantly writhing around and moving his arms and legs while he's in bed. Obviously, as we talked about already, the decreased sleep and agitation is a big factor here, already a clue that something is wrong. We've got more temper tantrums, a change in his personality. He's refusing to walk and wanting to be carried because of all these abnormal movements in the rest of his body. And he's constantly moving, even when he's lying down. Those are all factors that should make us say there's something going on here. So he was ultimately diagnosed, and you're noticing a theme here. Uh, I promise we'll break it soon. Anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis. He was treated aggressively with a combination of steroids, IVIG, plasma exchange, rituximab, tocilizumab, cyclophosphamide. Unfortunately, he still has residual disease. We're making some slow progress and steady progress. He's able to uh, smile and enjoy his surroundings a lot more than before, but even eight months out, he still has some degree of residual disease that we're working on. Movement disorders. These are oddly difficult to identify. And I think the reason for that is seizures tend to be 
I say obvious, but they can also be subtle. But movement disorders, sometimes patients are just constantly moving. You already noticed today, if you're watching my face for whatever reason, that I make a lot of hand movements when I speak. Um, those can sometimes just be normal voluntary movements. But we have to have a high index of suspicion when patients have these personality changes because when we're looking at the brain, these two structures are really the guides or control centers for movement. And there's a lot of those types of receptors that can, targeted by can be targeted by antibodies in those regions. This highlighted part on your bottom left-hand side of the screen is the frontal lobe. It controls all your voluntary movements, your ability to speak, your ability to focus and plan movements. These deeper structures that you see in the middle of the brain that are highlighted are your kind of control centers that make for smooth movement so that when you move your finger from point A to point B, you're not constantly making shaking movements or darting about or things like that. Again, this is most common with NMDA, but it is also increasingly being understood as being present in other antibody positive and antibody negative ones. We'll kind of break down the types of movement disorders that we see here, uh, but it varies from person to person. So you'll see a lot of stereotypical movements. And what that means is just a repetitive movement. So something as simple as rolling your wrist can be something that if seen with increasing frequency could be suggestive of a movement disorder. Oral facial dyskinesias, which are often just kind of rough movements, grimacing of the faces and things like that, that will often, as you notice with me, impact your speech patterns and things like that. It's not a speech disorder, it's a movement disorder. They'll often also have dystonia where they'll just get stuck in a very specific position. That can happen randomly or it can happen because they're moving. And then bradykinesia and catatonia kind of fall within the same spectrum where everything is just very, very slow. No matter how fast they want to move, they're unable to do so. And it takes them a minute to register what they're being told and to actually act that out. Movement disorders are a very prevalent thing that we see in NMDA and other autoimmune encephalitis happening in upwards of 75 or so percent of patients. As you'll hear, more common than actually seizures occurring in these patients. And so something that we really need to pay attention to in this population. The last case that I have for you kind of highlights the autonomic dysfunction that can happen. And this is a much more, I think of all of the different factors here, this is one of the hardest ones to ask about because it's not something that we routinely think about in hospital medicine and even really in neurology for the most part. But as you realize that this autonomic nervous system is being impacted more, you kind of get a flavor for what this looks like. Autonomic nervous system, for those who know, is uh, Latin for automatic. So this is the stuff that we don't think about. So when we get scared, our sympathetic nervous system, which is our fight, flight, or freeze system, tells us to either get pumping and get running, hide, uh, or try to actually fight, right? Or run away. This causes things like your heart rate to go up, your blood pressure to go up, for you to sweat. Uh, it also tells your body conversely when to rest, to digest, to poop, to pee, do all these types of things. Um, and this can be thrown off in, auto, in autoimmune encephalitis. So we've got a five-year-old previously healthy young girl who had changes in her mental status over the span of about four to six weeks. She was notably hypertensive, which means that her blood pressure was very elevated. And this considerably increased to where she was in the 160 over 100 range of blood pressure. Now, for a lot of adult patients, that may not raise a lot of eyebrows. Mm -hmm. For pediatric patients, that's a very, very high degree of blood pressure to be sustained for a long period of time. Once she got admitted to the hospital, she quickly became comatose, where we could not, no matter our best efforts, wake her up. And she had these odd skin findings. Uh, mom had noticed that in the preceding weeks to months, there was a necklace that she had from when they immigrated to the United States that the patient loved to chew on. For a long time, we thought there was some kind of heavy toxic metal exposure that was going on. Mm -hmm. She was noted on her exam to have a lot of hyperreflexia, where you would tap one of her muscles and she would just constantly move that muscle in response to it. And her pupils were asymmetric and they would just kind of flutter whenever you would put light to it. All of those things point to autonomic dysfunction. This patient, again, noting the hypertension, noting the fact that she very quickly became comatose after a few weeks with no cause, she ultimately got identified as having Casper II encephalitis. This is a rare form of autoimmune encephalitis, but a very important one is, in, is also increasing in uh, frequency of identification. This is, con this is a constellation of autonomic dysfunction where your blood pressure just skyrockets and stay high, stays high and you become comatose. She was treated aggressively with steroids, IVIG, and rituximab. She made a full recovery as though you would not know that she was admitted in the hospital in the first place. So autonomic dysfunction, this is very difficult to identify day one, because the way that we actually identify a lot of these factors is we have to trend this over days, sometimes even weeks. And a notable study in about close to 100 patients mm -hmm. found that sinus tachycardia, which is fancy just for elevated mm -hmm. heart rate and constipation of all things were the most common autonomic dysfunctions. 
Now, I don't know about you all, but a lot of kids end up having some degree of constipation and even adults have constipation at some point in their life. But taken in the context of everything else going on, these are very important things to ask about. The other types of autonomic dysfunction that you can see is something called central hypopnea, where patients are breathing well and fine during the daytime, but they'll have a lot of oxygen desaturations at night, almost like they have sleep apnea, where they'll just stop breathing in the middle of the night while they're sleeping, and the alarms will go off in the hospital. It's a clue that there's something else going on with your autonomic regulation system. Now, this is a patient that I took care of, I want to say three years ago now. And I highlight this one because they had they had the most marked and, and impressive auto autonomic dysfunction that I was able to appreciate. Um, you'll see that they have a wide range of their heart rate. They'll be as low as 60 or 40 and as high as you know, oftentimes even 200, right? And I put this red line here just to kind of show what we look at as clinicians or what we should be looking at as clinicians when we're talking about trending heart rates and blood pressures. You're looking for what that slope looks like. And this patient was intriguing because as you can see, all of these arrows are time points where we provided some kind of immune therapy. We did steroids, IVIG, plasma exchange, rituximab, and you'll notice this fourth arrow being rituximab, that's when that heart rate trend started to go back down. Didn't go back fast enough, the patient didn't respond, so we did tocilizumab. Their heart rate trend continued to go down. And then lastly, we did cyclophosphamide, and that's when you see that it really went back to that normal range and that tighter variability of their heart rate. So I point this out because this may not be something that's evident day one, but as you're evaluating your patients, it's something that you need to constantly be thinking about because this could make or break a diagnosis in some instances. Now, I've talked a lot about the clinical symptoms, but what I want to point out is that not one constellation of symptoms is enough to say that somebody does or does not have autoimmune encephalitis. These clinical findings are a tool to say, hey, we need to do more testing for our patient who's coming in with new personality changes, cognitive dysfunction, and some vague neurologic signs or symptoms that don't adequately localize to one part of the brain. So what we are then going to start doing is lab testing. CSF, MRI are going to be your most important things. But as we talked about with that reasonable exclusion of alternative causes, we've got to do a lot of blood testing as well. So the testing that we will do for any patient who we suspect has autoimmune encephalitis is imaging, cerebral spinal fluid assessments, EEG, and a whole lot of blood work. So MRI, always done with and without contrast. What we're looking for here is inflammation. So at rest, all of us have this thing called the blood-brain barrier. Its job is to help protect our brains from outside influences. It's a very tight degree, almost like a castle or a wall around your brain and your central nervous system. It decides what comes in. It decides what comes out. It helps keep unwanted chemicals outside of your brain and allows other things to come in that it chooses. Whenever there's significant inflammation, it can break down that wall and allow things to get in, including white blood cells that should not be in your brain. Interestingly enough, MRI abnormalities are less likely to be seen in patients with NMDA and more likely to be seen in other types of antibody positive, but most importantly, antibody negative autoimmune encephalitis and ADEM. So this is an example of a patient who ended up getting diagnosed with limbic encephalitis secondary to IgI, IgL1. As you can see here, I'll just point it out because it's fairly subtle. Their temporal lobe or their hippocampus was impacted by some kind of inflammatory process and there was a signal change there. This patient ended up having ADEM. You can see this one's a little bit more obvious. The medical students in the back of the room can identify this one. And so this one uh, is one that is very important to keep in mind and why it kind of suggests why imaging is so important. All these patients kind of had a similar clinical presentation, but the imaging kind of helps guide things. This patient ended up having, I believe it was, oh, was it one of, I think this was also IGLO and one. Can't fully remember right now, but I'll, I'll find out in just a minute. They had some inflammatory changes on the deeper structures of their brain. And this one here is a patient who ended up having Bickerstaff encephalitis. All of this is to point out that imaging is not always going to be the thing that gives you a diagnosis, but it's just part of the diagnostic process to figure out what is going on. In a patient with this constellation of symptoms of personality change, maybe seizures, movement disorders, et cetera, who has a normal MRI, you're looking more at NMDA versus primary psychiatric disease. In a patient who has an abnormal finding, it may help guide you towards those typical patterns of things like IGL-1 or CASPER or MOG or things like that. 
What's really important though is early on, when you're in that still purple phase where you're primarily psychiatric, you may not have any MRI abnormalities. You have to have a high index of suspicion to consider if you need to repeat that imaging one, two, three, or even four months down the road. The other type of imaging that we routinely use in autoimmune encephalitis is body imaging, CT scans, PET scans, combined CT PET scans. What we're doing here is looking for tumors. So like we've talked about with NMDA in our adolescent females and adult females, because a third will have some kind of ovarian teratoma or other tumor, you really want to look for that by using body imaging. In a patient where the answer may not be super clear, finding a tumor may help you cinch that diagnosis. And most importantly, if they have a tumor, you've got to remove that tumor. None of our treatments consistently work if there is a tumor because your immune system says, hey, this neuromodulatory therapy has helped calm us down, but hey, there's still a target. That tumor's still there. So once the effect of the medications wear off, the immune system attacks the tumor, and again, by extension, starts attacking the brain again. In cases where we have a confirmed autoimmune encephalitis, what's really important is even if the first round of body imaging is negative, it is recommended to repeat these annually for at least the next five years because it might be that we identify a tumor later, especially in our patients who have relapsing or refractory disease. Blood testing. Uh, I would not say that this is uh, conclusive in terms of or, or extensive in terms of all the things that we may get. It all depends on the clinical history, but this is often the set of things that I will obtain. MOG antibody, an autoimmune encephalitis panel, thyroid studies, ANA, which is a marker of systemic inflammatory diseases, antiphospholipids, your immunoglobulin levels. These next things, TP testing, hepatitis B, varicella, EMV, these are infectious studies. A lot of the treatments that we use, in fact, the mainstay of treatment for patients who have autoimmune encephalitis is impacting the immune system. As such, if I'm going to suppress your immune system, I need to know what are you at risk of having complications of because of my treatment. And so those types of testings, while not going to while it's not going to tell us if you have autoimmune encephalitis, it's going to help us in terms of protecting you when you're getting your treatments. Um, and then complements and anti, and those antiantibodies are all things that look at systemic diseases like lupus scleroderma, juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Why are we doing that though? So when we talked about that reasonable exclusion of alternative criteria, there are diseases of the body, immune diseases of the body like lupus that can then actually impact our brain and cognitive function as well. While we can put them along the spectrum of autoimmune encephalitis, they are still a unique entity because the brain complications are a result of the body complications. And so as a neurologist, we're also looking at the rest of the body, which may make a lot of sense to some people, but something that we sometimes can miss. And so I'll often do a full head-to-toe evaluation of patients looking at their face, their hands, looking at the function of their salivary glands, looking at their tongue for lesions and things like that, because all of these findings can help you identify, is there another explanation for where the inflammation in their brain is coming from? Because these do, of course, have treatment implications. The last part of our diagnostic testing before EEG is CSF. Now, a lot of parents will get scared about lumbar puncture because rightfully so, it's a needle going into your, essentially your, your central nervous system. Uh, but this is a very safe procedure. Uh, there's no risk of long-term nerve damage. It's something that parents often tell me they're worried about. Uh, and it's increasingly common, something that us neurologists are doing. Uh, there was a period of time where we weren't doing it as much. Uh, what we'll do is we'll take a very small needle, put it in the lowest part of your back where there are no nerve endings and draw the fluid that's in there that's produced in your brain. That fluid is very helpful because it's essentially a window into what the white blood cells are doing in your brain. Is there some kind of signs of inflammation there? What's very interesting is initial CSF very early in the course may not be positive in patients who ultimately get diagnosed with autoimmune encephalitis, but about two thirds are gonna have some kind of abnormality. What types of abnormalities? So there's a few things we look at. We look at your white blood cells. We look at your protein counts. We look to see if there's any evidence of infection. We can also do oligoclonal band testing, neopterin, and of course the autoimmune encephalitis panel are gold standard. When should we be worried about the white blood cell count? anything more than four, but generally less than 60. Those are mild elevations in white count. When we look at autoimmune encephalitis, what's so interesting is despite how drastic patients can look, there may only be a small elevation in your white blood count. Whereas when you have patients who have an infection, they're in the hundreds, 200s, mm -hmm. 500s range in terms of the amount of white blood cells in the, center, in the cerebral spinal fluid. But I want to point this out because I've had instances where clinicians will look at an, an abnormality and okay. say, let's say it's six. 
That alarm bells for me, while other people who may not be thinking of autoimmune encephalitis as much may say, that must not be that abnormal. Maybe it was a lab error. I would take any value over four very seriously, especially if it fits within the clinical context. Protein counts, anything greater than 40. While this is not going to be the most definitive study, this is something that we can see when there's a significant and sustained degree of inflammation, some part of that aspect of the testing that's very important. Again, infection testing is so important because some infections can look and have that chronic course like autoimmune encephalitis, obviously something we have to test for before we suppress the immune system. Oligoclonal band testing is uh, interesting. It's a little bit newer. It's something that I would always recommend getting in patients who you even remotely suspect have autoimmune encephalitis because early on, this may be the only abnormality. What we do is we take a sample of cerebral spinal fluid. We take a sample of blood. We put them on some gelatin and we run electricity through them. They create these very pretty lines. And what we're looking for is this darker outline here. Now, this is a subjective test, but something that's very good to obtain. What that tells us is that there are antibodies that should not be in the brain that are in the brain and may be the only sign that someone has autoimmune encephalitis. Neopterin is a bit of a newer test. I put this here because there's some preliminary data and just, and just some anecdotal evidence that says that this is increasingly being identified in patients who have autoimmune encephalitis and specifically NMDA receptor encephalitis. So in patients who you may not be certain, you want to get as many tests to help collaborate and corroborate what you're identifying here. And this is going to be another helpful tool in our belt. Autoimmune encephalitis panel. This one's interesting. Um, commercial assays are becoming much more common. So there's a lot of labs in the, in the community that have identified this as an important area of testing. But unfortunately, there's not a lot of definitive data that says they're as good as our more scientific labs. So the commercial test may not be as good as the scientific ones. So if you get a commercial test, i.e. through one of the more uh, common labs that exist within hospital systems, your sensitivity may be only 85%. What does that mean? That means if I have 100 patients who I think have autoimmune encephalitis and I test all of their CSF, 85 of them will be identified correctly, but 15 of them may not be identified correctly. And there may be a chance that you have a false negative where everything else is fitting for autoimmune encephalitis, but you don't identify that definitive antibody in that initial testing. And so I always recommend if you have a patient who have a high index of suspicion, go for one of the more research-focused labs like the Mayo Clinic or things like that. Um, EEG, I realize I don't have a slide for that just now. I probably intended to put it in the seizure slide. I, I'm not going to show a lot of EEGs because I think those are a little bit difficult, but really what we're looking for in EEG, we're looking at how your brain is talking to itself. Your brain talks with electricity and some smart person a hundred years ago figured out that if I put electrodes on your head, I can measure that electrical outcome and look at what that talking and communicating of the brain looks like. In autoimmune encephalitis, most often what we'll see is slowing. Not frank seizures, no things like that, but just slowing. Everything is just moving slower than usual for the person's brain. Sometimes we'll be able to identify seizures, but more often than not, what we're looking for is what is your brain talking like? And if it's moving more slowly on that EEG, that may be a sign of what's going on. Now, again, like I said, I'm not going to talk too much about treatment, but I am going to talk about outcomes. And the reason that this is important is despite this being around for so long, we still don't have a lot of great measures for what outcome looks like because the main thing that we often use in, in, in literature is something called the modified Rankine scale. As you can see, it's a pretty straightforward scale. Zero is no symptoms and all the way over to six, which is death. Five is severe disability, four is moderate, and so on and so forth. The reason this is kind of difficult to interpret is that it doesn't give a lot of space for psychiatric, lingering psychiatric manifestations doesn't give a lot of space for subtle sleep disturbances and things like that. And so um, we're, we're going to work on finding better ways to assess long-term outcomes. But I think anything that we can do to characterize what those long-term disabilities are for our patients is going to be helpful because what we see is in patients who got treated earlier and who also importantly, if a tumor was present, had that removed, their outcomes are much better. So patients who are treated less than three months after symptom onset, who obviously have all of the appropriate treatments put into place, have a much better outcome one to two years out compared to patients who have a considerable delay of treatment. Those patients where we delay that diagnosis or we just can't diagnose it for months and months, if not years, they do have a higher likelihood of having some kind of long-term sequelae, some kind of psychiatric manifestations, possibly epilepsy, possibly movement disorder, et cetera. This just shows the importance of that tumor screening. As you can see, the blue is recovered or mild deficits with early tumor removal. 
and red is severe deficits or death. In patients where no tumor is identified, those outcomes can be variable, but it also depends on when you identify it. When you even delay that tumor removal, the outcomes are not as good. And so what I put all of this uh, out there, the takeaways really for all of this is mm -hmm. always think about autoimmune encephalitis in a patient who comes in with new onset personality changes or significant cognitive dysfunction. There is no single finding on history or exam that tells you you have autoimmune encephalitis. CSF testing can be really helpful, but even that may not be definitive early on. It's never too early or too late to make a diagnosis. Obviously, we want to go to identifying it early, as early as possible so we can start treatment, but better late than never is how you should always approach it because as long as you identify it, you can do something about it. Prior history of psychiatric disease does not rule out the possibility of autoimmune encephalitis. I want that to be very clear for everyone involved, that even if a patient has a long history of psychiatric disease, you cannot say that they don't have autoimmune encephalitis because of that. You may need to do repeat testing. I have had a number of patients where they come in day one of symptoms, we find nothing, we treat them for psychiatric disease for a time, but they clearly progress. We repeat that testing two, three months later, and now they have a definitive diagnosis of autoimmune encephalitis. And I, and I hope this is the main takeaway for clinicians. If psychiatric symptoms with any other neurologic abnormality present, sleep disturbances, seizure, movement disorder, constipation, it's worth it to do the whole workup. And the reason is that for a lot of diseases, primarily psychiatric diseases, there is no cure. There's treatments. We can do something to ameliorate their symptoms. But for autoimmune encephalitis, making a diagnosis at one month versus six months has a huge impact on patient lives. And most importantly, we can do something about this disease constellation. And so if you have a, you have to have a high index of suspicion to identify these patients as early as possible. I've been talking a lot about individual symptoms, and that's why I wanted to put this here to not miss the forest for the trees. Each individual symptom, again, does not in and of itself have a whole lot of significance. But when you take all of those symptoms and put them into one constellation of findings, you have a higher likelihood of identifying these patients. And it's the same thing with lab tests. Not all of our lab tests are perfect. It's often little bits and pieces of everything being put together that help us diagnose these patients when they don't have the obvious NMDA receptor encephalitis presentation. And again, I just want to draw your attention to, again, this diagnostic criteria, subacute personality changes, really rapid, less than three months with any new seizures, new focal findings on exam, abnormalities of CSF, abnormalities of MRI. It is quintessential that we do this workup whenever possible in patients. So I'll just add now time for questions. Um, I'm a huge Tolkien fan for anyone who was also a Tolkien fan. Uh, I love this uh, quote because I don't, uh, I've, I've kind of had a new relationship to science. I used to love science for science's sake. And now I feel science's main purpose in this world is to help patients. So it doesn't matter how fancy your scientific analysis is. If it's not going to be able to help patients, it may not have as much value in, in, in the grand scheme of things. Um, and so for that, I'll go ahead and let uh, there be time for questions. That was wonderful. We could, why don't you um, put your, your screen down, your slides down, so we can uh, see you from, there you go. Thank you so much. I just wanted to point out, Dr. Kushnud, that two people in the chat have uh, been very thankful, uh, praising your presentation at, at, at how much they've appreciated it and the clarity that um, they've received from your talk today. Um, the first question is, uh, have you heard a, a few, this person has heard a few times now that AE burns out, they're putting that in quotes, after two years in pediatrics. So there's no need to treat after two years after Ron said, just symptom support. What are your thoughts on that? So I would say that's that's an interesting thought. I, I, the, the problem here is that two, two things. I think the question is, why were they being missed for a couple of years? I think that's a really important aspect there. I think those types of cases, while that might have been the case 10, 15, maybe even five years ago, I think that's decreasingly becoming the case that patients have that degree of symptoms for two years and are not identified. I think the second thing is this. Whenever we do workups, and I think even if you're consisting the, the fact that maybe their symptoms are milder now, 
if there's evidence of inflammation in the central nervous system, if there's evidence of an antibody that we're identifying in the CSF, whether you have mild symptoms, whether you have severe symptoms, I think it's worth doing treatments. And whether you may not go to something like cyclophosphamide first out, you still, I think it is warranted to try some degree of symptoms because if you have signs of inflammation, there may that may suggest there's ongoing damage. And the other important thing that probably didn't get talked about too much in this lecture, and I apologize because it's a little bit more sciencey, a lot of the receptor structure and milieu gets altered by antibody attack by antibodies attacking it. And so if there's antibodies circulating your brain, those receptors may not be in the same concentration and presence on the different parts of your brain as they ordinarily would be. And so you don't have time to recover truly when there's still ongoing inflammation. And so my thoughts are, if you have evidence of inflammation, even if it's been two, three, four, five, six years, it is worth considering some degree of treatment to see if you can claw back some degree of function. Mm -hmm. When and what are the factors which you consider it to reduce the anti-seizure medication doses? Is it the EEG or the clinical condition? If the seizures stop or how many months the patient is suffering from AE due to, uh, well, this person is mentioning this is a GAD 65 uh, yeah. in for two years so far. It's a great question. Um, so I typically will go combination. So both the clinical picture and the EEG. So in patients, for example, with NMDA, this is the classic one. These patients typically are not epileptogenic once you've treated them aggressively, right? Um, typically once my patients have stopped seizing, uh, some of them I have noticed, uh, this is anecdotal and this is not evidence-based, but I had some families where they just forget mm. to take the medicine for a long period of time. Mm. And that's kind of the proof in and of itself where they've just forgotten for two weeks and they haven't seized. And so, well, let's just try them off. But in other instances, it is a combination of clinical picture and EEG. In patients with things like GAT65, where they are a little bit more epileptogenic long-term, I'll typically go with the typical rules of, of, of epilepsy. Once you've gone two years of seizure freedom, repeat an EEG, if there are signs of increased risk of epilepsy, i.e. epileptiform discharges, I would be wary to try them off of medicines. But in some patients, they're very motivated to try off. And I think if you've adequately treated the underlying autoimmune encephalitis, you can try patients off after six months to 12 months where you take them off of the medicine slowly, see how they do. And if they don't seize again, fantastic. But if they do, they have... Uh, they basically obviously reach out to you and say, hey, unfortunately, doctor, I've had a seizure, and you repeat the cycle. Mm -hmm. Do you begin rituximab usually at the first phase of treatment? Thank you for asking that, Tabitha. I actually realized there was a, a part of my slide that I didn't mention. So increasingly, we're identifying that as we use rituximab mm -hmm. early on in autoimmune encephalitis, specifically NMDA, there's a lower risk of relapse. Relapse of autoimmune encephalitis has a huge Im impact as it pertains to long-term outcomes. And so what we found interestingly is that in patients who received a combination of plasma exchange, but most importantly, rituximab early, less than three months around the time of their initial diagnosis, they have a lower likelihood of having relapse and ongoing disease. And so part of my treatment algorithm in a patient who I've confirmed as NMDA is early on, whether or not they completely respond to steroids, IVIG, plasma exchange, I will give them rituximab because I suspect that it goes from a relapse rate of something like 30 to 40% down to less than 10%. And those are considerable numbers, I think. We're, we're getting a few questions asking if the if this recording will be available and I and so many people are asking that you can go to our YouTube channel, the International Autoimmune Encephalitis Society YouTube channel at Autoimmune Encephalitis Society. We're going to have the recording up within 24 hours. Check in 10 hours and it will likely be there. I have uh, several uh, guests that, that are asking that question. And again, Dr. Kushnud, you're receiving so much praise for this presentation uh, by, by clinicians and parents here. Um, here's, a, here's another question. Would you con continue to treat with immunotherapy after the acute attack? And if so, how long would you continue that? Now, there's a, yeah. a dicey and challenging question. Yeah, it always is. And in, in, in every situation, it depends on the patient. Um, so my approach, uh, and typically this is kind of something that we see is, 
Um, I've been fairly underwhelmed with chronic oral mm -hmm. steroids in NMDA receptor encephalitis. And so I will often not use chronic oral daily steroids. I will use pulse steroids as needed. I will use IVIG as needed. I will use plasma exchange only when needed. Uh, but often for patients who receive rituximab, I do basically that one round of rituximab and I will wait until their B cells come back, mm -hmm. assuming they recovered. If they have no symptoms, their B cells recover and they don't relapse, that tells me they don't need any more immune therapy. Okay. Typically what you will find is, and I talked about this a little bit, is that once you get immune therapy, the real test of whether or not you're going to relapse is once the immune therapy wears off. And that requires a working knowledge of how those works. IVIG, for example, lasts about eight weeks. Steroids last about three to four weeks. Plasma exchange up to a few weeks. Rituximab up to about six months. Mm -hmm. And so once patients start to have their B cells come back, that's the sign that they're going to need more or not. If their B cells come back, make more antibodies and cause you to have symptoms, you're going to need more immune therapy. If on the other hand, your B cells come back and you are functional, no residual problems, no new problems, recurrence of seizures or things like that, then you don't need any more immune therapy. You can be continued to be monitored clinically for the time being and see how things go. So it's a very individual approach for each patient. Um, but one that requires really con careful consideration about when to start, when to stop continued immune therapy. Um, there's, a, there's a few more questions, and I think one was answered in your talk, which is, does the MRI usually show up with abnormalities in a majority of patients? And would you say 50% sometimes? It really depends. It all depends on the subtype. For the many of the known antibody positive autoimmune encephalitides, there will be some kind of abnormality in anywhere from 30 to 60%. It depends on the subtype. And most articles that talk about MRI abnormalities will break it down based off of subtype. Um, NMDA, I would say it's less than 15% will have an abnormal MRI. I can count on one hand the number of NMDA patients who had an abnormal MRI, uh, but again, depending on the subtype. Um, <clears throat> it's an important one to consider. Again, early on, you may not have abnormalities, even in patients who have, uh, you know, uh, IGL-1 and 5 or IGL-1. Uh, but uh, in patients with NMDA, you may never have an abnormal MRI. Uh, and so it's part of the diagnostic process to help identify a subtype if you can. But I would say 30 to 60%, again, depending on the subtype. But you won't know at the time that you get the MRI. <laughs> just, just to follow up on that, um, do you find that there would be an advantage in having the the FDG PET? Early on, so that's an interesting question. I've heard from a lot of my adult colleagues that they will get FDG PET early on mm -hmm. in patients who they have a strong suspicion, while mm -hmm. even while they're waiting for CSF studies. Um, I, I don't think that's something that I've routinely done in my pediatric patients for the most part. Um, they're going to have the CSF come back. We're going to have a reasonable answer as to whether we think it's autoimmune encephalitis or not. And I've not had a situation where FDG PET in my practice has made a difference. But in a patient who comes back positive for a subtype that's not common, for example, it's not an MDA, I may consider the FDG PET as part of the overall diagnostic workup to help further clarify. Right. Is that ever used? Um, it. it because you're saying to assist in treatment, to assist with diagnosis and treatment plan, but is it ever used to see if the disease is no longer active, like you're looking for hypometabolism or something like that? There's been some adult studies that look at that to try to see maybe is there some kind of benefit here. I think for the most part, your clinical course CSF analysis, um, those types of things might be better in terms of identifying things. FDG okay. PET just has a lot of potential risks associated with it if you get repeated studies over a long period of time. Right. I think we have other markers that I think are a little bit better, like repeat lumbar puncture, repeat MRI, repeat blood testing, EEG, and then the clinical course to kind of help guide mm -hmm. that management recommendations. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. I'm going to stop the questions now because we could be here all day. This has been so helpful. And I have to say, when I look through the questions and answers, almost every other one is thanking you for this presentation. Um, it's really been wonderful. Um, and I will uh, make sure that the video recording gets out mm -hmm. within the day for all of those that, uh, that are clamoring at mm -hmm. the bit.
and wish you all a wonderful autoimmune encephalitis awareness month. And thank you so much, Malad, for joining us today. Absolutely. My pleasure. And for families who have questions or might be in the Southern California area who maybe want to be seen for a second opinion or anything like that, I put my email up earlier. Um, I don't uh, say that I'm going to be able to give an answer necessarily, but I do believe that parental and physician uh, uh, knowledge is power, so to speak. So being able to help families advocate better, being able to help physicians uh, have like a lifeline, so to speak, and not to say that I'm the end-all be-all expert. I may have to uh, bring in the reinforcements, so to speak, but if any other questions that maybe I didn't answer today or any kind of burning questions come up, I'm more than happy to help engage with those as well. That's wonderful because so often a, a clinician is seeing their very first patient and to know that they would be able to reach out to ask questions and collaborate with you on the case is key to success in serving our community. Absolutely. It's Absolutely. wonderful. Okay. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you, Tabitha. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.